All right, so we're, we're recording, we're live. Welcome to uh, week five. This is uh, the fifth chapter in Advanced Art Control Flow. Uh, my name is Eric Knoxted. Um, love participating in this book club with everyone. It's been great. Okay, so the outline for the chapter, it's um, touches on conditional logic and the tools we have to do conditional checks. And he calls it choices, which makes sense, intuitive sense there. So you have if, if else, which in case when, and we'll go through each of those and the differences and um, some of the advantages of um, one versus the other. And different out in the way it outputs um, values and, and some of those nuances. And then the uh, second part is iteration, looping, um, looping an activity or an action multiple times. Um, which is super powerful for getting analysis um, that is um, something you can repeat over and over again and just automate a lot of the manual grind. So we'll go through that as well. And then I do the exercises. So we'll look at the exercises at the very end. I just stuck both sections, exercises in, in the, um, the back section so we can do all that at once. All right, what's the basic form of an if statement? This is um, actually presented directly in the uh, book, so I copied it over. The um, conditions, it's, it's effectively, you could think of it like English, right? Like if this, um, then do that. And that, that can be it. You can also say uh, otherwise do something else. Uh, the second part's not necessary. And it can be um, the cool thing about the the otherwise section, the else section, is you can then set another uh, conditional check, and you can keep nesting those. Um, so if you can branch out quite confusingly. It does become a muddle, um, but it, that's um, an if statement in R, I think it's pretty similar. I don't know other languages except for like using them in Excel or, or DAX, but it's all the same in those different, in SQL, so, um, but it's the same there. So this could be familiar to a lot of people, especially um, since we're reading this book already, but if we have questions about it, we can dive in more. So what are some valid inputs for the condition section? Um, this is you know, like, what are we putting in that, in that closet well and the things that we can put in there those valid inputs need to um, result in a true or false and just one and, and just one evaluation um, for if um, so whatever the check is like if it's red um, put it on your head because it's a cool hat from st louis maybe or you know whatever the uh, conditional check may be but it needs to evaluate to a single true or false all right, what about for the action? Uh, for the action, we can just put in a, a value to have, have that returned, or we can um, perform an action that is gonna return a value. That's the, um, so you can put a function in there, you could, you could put a lot of um, different objects in there, or just a, a value outright and um, get that output. And, and like I said, the ask for false, you don't have to put anything in there. Uh, so if, it, if the condition does um, turn out to be false and there's not an else, it'll um, just return an A because um, it's unknown, right? There's no, no other uh, option. And, the, and one cool thing he points out is um, like print and, and there was a few other functions, they actually handle NAs by dropping them. So if you leave it out, and he had this his example where it was like, hello, Hadley, and if it's his birthday, then it um, um, prints out uh, a happy birthday. If it's not, then there's nothing. So you can use that to your advantage. Um, yeah, so what does it return? Yeah, it returns a value. Or an NA on false, right? So there's like an extra level. Um, so what's the difference now between if, where there's a condition with the only valid input being something that's gonna return a, tr a single true or false condition and if else. 
Uh, well, with if else, it's effectively vectorized. It is vectorized. So it can run that condition. It can loop through a series of items and or values and run the conditional check each time, um, returning, uh, performing that action or returning that value for each item. Uh, so while, yeah, so while if only accepts that single um, condition, if else can, uh, it's vectorized, which is pretty cool. Um, and is there an alternative to if else? There is. How about that? So for, um, that's not my kid. Uh, so for, um, Tidyverse, actually, um, there's the case win statement, and that allows you to um, not only enjoy that vectorized if else, but you can succinctly put in multiple condition value pairs where you can say, okay, so if it's um, greater than seven, do this, and it's got the little tilde for, um, for then. So it's like, if this and, and the syntax, I didn't specifically point out the syntax in the, in the slide, but it's in the book, but um, it allows you to concisely express um, conditional actions to take based on the values or um, the conditional, what the conditional checks re, re, uh, return. So it's uh, a little more convenient to, it could be a little more convenient to use. It's pretty powerful. Okay, so this lets us do the logical branches, right? So we could fit in another if statement in the if, if the condition returns false um, and we put in an else statement in that else statement we can actually nest another if and start the check over again um, but that can get pretty convoluted so there is a uh, another option which is switch uh, so switch lets you um, effectively define the um, I think it's always a vector. I wasn't really sure on, on switch that much, but you basically identify where you want the, the checks to occur. And then in the body of the uh, statement, you're saying, okay, so um, if, if, if when you're looking through this vector, you find this. So it's, a, it's almost like, so this is in, in that vector, do that. If, if this is in that vector, then um, do something else. So on and, and it was on and on. And you guys can correct me if I'm, misunderstanding that one, but that was my um, intuition for switch. You define the, the vector where you're gonna check um, where you want the condition to be evaluated, then you put in the um, the values that you wanna find and the out and the outcomes that you want to base on on those values. And it's a nice succinct way of, of um, doing nested if statements. I got the camera on, buddy. All right. Um, I, I got the camera on, sweetheart. All right, politics. Office politics. Um, so that's that's a switch. And yeah, that was, that was it for switch. Uh, so switch statements is really cool. And one of the things to, to point out with switch is you don't, if you don't um, input a return value and you leave it blank and it, it moves down to the next one, it's gonna, the value will fall. I didn't quite understand that either, to be honest with you. Um, so maybe we can talk about that after the, um, after the presentation. And all right, so now we're in the, 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 the phase where we have this action, we don't wanna do it all over and over again. So what can we do? Um, well, this is where iteration comes in. And with iteration, a lot of the functions, this is one of um, the advantages of R is a lot of the functions have iteration um, built into it. It's like if you do mean of a vector, it's gonna iterate each item, sum it up, do all, all that stuff for us, right? So, and, and you can do within mean, you can have it check multiple columns and and do the sum and then take the mean of that. So it's it's uh, the iterative process is built in, which is super handy. But it's there's going to be times where we want to define our own uh, our own uh, looping logic. And so the way you do that is you have your um, 
and four is is one of the um, the most common. So it's basically four, um, this item, and this vector of values perform this action or that action, however you, however you want to call it. And you actually don't need to use the value assigned to the item. So the item is going to get the value that's uh, next in in the index, but you don't need to use it. So you can actually just perform an action however many times there are rows in the item you're looping over or the range you're looping over, which is, is pretty interesting. Um, but you but you can, it's, a, it's an assignment. So you're assigning the, the value in the first row to the to the item, then you're using that item in the body of the for loop. So assignments taking place, and if and you can do what you need to do with um, with that with that item, or not use it at all. And it's still just you're controlling how many times the the action will uh, will take place. So if you had like one through ten, and you do i um, in vector one through 10, and it will do the action in the, in the body of the for loop 10 times, but you can also use the value at each index. So the value one at index one, the value two, I think that's how it goes, it's not zero. But anyway, you can use the value, I promise. Um, so what happens to that value that's assigned to the item? Um, it's effectively equivalent to assigning the value um, to the, to the item, you can name like the common names are like I, J, but you can call it whatever you want, and then call it in the in the for loop. And it happens, assignment happens in the execution environment. So if you're if you're placing the for loop in a function, then assignments in the, the function environment and that um, value won't be returned to your working environment unless you. Um, return the value, not, so you, at the end you don't assign it uh, to a name and you just return the value in the function, then you'll get it in your, in your um, working environment and you can use it as, a, as an output. Um, but the reason that's important to, to kind of wrap our heads around is, um, and because, so assignments happening, the, uh, the items getting the value in the, in the vector you're iterating, iterating over, but you need to allocate some memory, some space, a place, a holder for the, those values to go. So you can keep sliding in the values you're creating in your, in your for loop into a predefined space. And it can, you can define the, uh, the, the space as a list, or you can define it as a, a double vector, or a character vector, or a, a logical vector. Um, but then your action in the for loop needs to actually return those um, value types. But doing that will then make for loops super efficient. And otherwise, it's going to create the, the, the space every iteration, and that's when it gets really slow. And so if you're just doing a for loop in your regular environment, then um, you want to define the object before the for loop or the, the container before the for loop. If you're doing it inside the function, then define the holder, the, the place where you're going to store your values inside the function before you do the, the for loop. Yeah, so that's when should I create the container and where I got ahead of myself there. So yeah. All right, so they use the index to determine the number of iterations. Oh yeah, so what if we don't know how many uh, iterate, how many times we need to iterate, um, right? So you can, um, you can lean on the length of the, the vector, but if you don't know it, what do you do? Well, there's some other, um, two other tools for us to use, um, and that's the while loop and the repeat loop. With uh, while loops, you're effectively setting a condition, and then at, when the conditions, um, is it true or false? Anyway, so the condition is set. I forget if it has to evaluate the true or false. I think it evaluates to true. Okay, so if the condition evaluates to true, then it will stop. That makes sense. No, no, it's while this is true, do this. Oh, while it's true. Okay, so while it's true, right, so if it's less than five, if the value is less than five, then continue to, 
to loop through the, um, the vector. If it's false, then it stops. And then there's the repeat loop, which just goes until it encounters break and which can effectively be in, indefinite. And I'd, I'd like to explore repeat a little bit. I'd, I don't know that I've ever, I haven't used it, but I didn't quite understand uh, where that's useful, but it must be useful because, um, yeah, and if anyone knows why it's useful, I'm all ears, but it must be useful because he says uh, effectively that anything you do with, uh, with four, you can do with wow, but you can't do everything you can do in wow with four and then again with repeat you can do everything you could do with while and repeat but not everything you do with repeat you can do in while so i don't even understand how you control repeat to get it to be that um to do all the stuff you do with four i don't quite grasp it but it sounds cool um sounds sounds powerful all right so now we're at some exercises did we have any comments on loops or do we want to wait till the end i mean um i mean i can comment on the ability to do the four from the the um, repeat right because you can you could just set it up so that you have a counter inside it and say break in this con on the if condition right so like and then you just get the same thing back so you could just do like i equals i plus one and then keep going and say when i if i equals 100 break right now you've created a a for loop Right. So we, but I don't know why I would ever do that. Like, cause you know, I think that's what it, they're trying to say is just use a for loop because the iteration is going to be faster and you're not checking an additional if statement. Um, that makes sense. <laughs> so yeah. that'd be like when you're using for loop, but you're not using the value or value being assigned to the item, you're just using it as a counter. You could just create the counter inside the, the while loop. Yeah instead of relying on the, the length of the vector okay yeah I, I just wonder if like there's some weird like if a, if a, if you use a repeat you know if like you have some really weird bespoke set of possible conditions and the conditions can't be put into one logical statement like you're like oh if this really weird edge case or this really weird edge case or this thing happens break you know um maybe that's when a repeat works but um uh, i've never encountered a use for it so it seems like it would be something that's that you would use if you knew that it was almost always going to work and that, like you said edge cases yeah like but i, I don't yeah i don't I've never i've never seen it used or used it it just seems too dangerous to me wild wow, loops in general seem dangerous so yeah yeah because what the threat is that it just runs and you yeah yeah yeah, I, I've used while loops, but always with this fear that I better make sure that the condition is eventually met. For loops are self-contained usually, and but I've never used repeat. Yeah, I think for while loops, I, I add a second condition, like something like, you know, run this while for like a thousand times, you know, like I'm assuming it's going to happen before then, but if it doesn't just break anyway, like, you know, if a counter hits a thousand stop or something like that, because then the code doesn't run forever. Um, but yeah, I mean, I definitely have to restart my R many, many times because of this problem. Is there a different way to set uh, an end cap on an iteration? Like if you, if you had a for loop that you were just testing out and you wanted to like, yeah, like you said, like have it run for like the first thousand lines and then stop, or would you just like, I would just change. I would just change the index, yeah, to okay. run to a thousand. Yeah, I just wasn't sure if there was like a. Yeah, I don't know if there's a smarter way, but that's what I do. Cool. I had uh, thoughts. Sorry. I had questions about for loop stuff. If if I don't know if we want to talk about that after the exercises, but just like general for loop philosophy questions. <laughs> Cause I, so I was, I've always been told like, oh, R is bad with for loops. Um, don't use for loops in R. And I use them anyway, uh, because until Tidyverse came along, I could just never figure out apply. Um, and also I don't work with any, I wasn't working with anything big enough for it to like the slowness to be a problem. 
but in the in the book where it says you define your output container first and that improves the efficiency and the speed of the for loop like does anyone know if that improves it enough to overcome this like problematic element of for loops in r or is it still like it's better than if you don't define that container off the bat but it's still not I mean, I, I was setting aside the idea of like, I know Hadley would prefer functional programming and per for everything. Um, yeah, I was, just I was just thinking about that. Um, go, ahead, go ahead, Mike. I was gonna say, um, uh, I've learned this the hard way. Uh, setting up your container ahead of time is a big deal if you don't know what to expect. And uh, this happened, uh, there, there's this, uh, this thing that happens in December called Ad Event of code. Has anyone heard of that? It's a series of programming challenges. You can choose whatever language you want to, but it's like a series of puzzles and you have to write code to, uh, to solve them. And uh, some of them are kind of like, uh, you know, wandering into a swamp. And that's where I learned the hardware, where, where I set up a, um, a for loop to answer a question and it ran for about 40 minutes before it gave me the output. Because what it was doing was rebuilding the vector or the container every single time. It was just starting from zero every single time. And it was like a 12 days of Christmas kind of thing, you know, just regenerating and regenerating and regenerating. So that's when people told me, oh, you know what you need to do. You need you set up your, your, your container ahead of time and then populate it and you'll, it'll be much more efficient. Yeah, I really do think that's uh, the key there to for loops being as effective as apply or, or the maps or whatever. I do know that he write, he uh, Hadley wrote map and all the, all that stuff in C. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know that he did that because of um, significant performance. I, he, he, he said something in the talk and it wasn't like, it's not that it's super fast or it was for some other, other reasons. Um, so I do think, yeah, if you assign a container and then you, um, place your values in there, you'll be fine. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think what I've seen is that if you're if you're following most best practices, like the speed difference is marginal between most languages. It's only like if you're really, like if you're doing a lot of high-end production code where it needs to be very fast and there are efficiencies you can gain from not using for loops, but I would imagine for data analysis purposes, it's usually sufficient. Okay, cool, that's interesting. Thank you guys. Oh, and one cool uh, take I read on this is because, um, yeah, this this is on Twitter just a day or two ago. And he was like, with four loops, um, it's super grounded, right? Like you're working nuts and bolts with um, with your data, with your process. You're 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 really in the weeds with it, with um, map and, and, and the functional programming it's extracted away so you're able to focus more on the higher level purpose of the analysis it's easier to go back and and kind of understand what the intent was um, so there's also that aspect like when you go in when you're down in the weeds um, writing your your loops um, it's low level it's it's um, it, and, and it can just be harder to then pick back up why what the intent was when you're when you're going back in, in it later on. I, I thought it was a compelling argument. That, that makes a lot of sense, actually. That's like a helpful perspective for it. Because I, I do find myself sometimes when I'm like, okay, I know I should use a map function for this, but I almost have to write the for loop first in my brain or even just in the code to think about what I'm actually trying to do. And I don't know if that's just because I, you know, learned programming the, the DIY way. Um, but that's, yeah. I, yeah, I'm, right, I'm right there with you. I, yeah. I, I've been very slow learning map and in fact, um, slow in apply as well, because to me, four is very explicit about what you're doing. You're saying, start at one and yeah. go to this point and do this thing that number of times. And that to me is a lot more intuitive than either apply, apply syntax or map syntax. And I've made map work for me, but Every time I want to try to do it again, I have to look up the, the syntax, what are the arguments, whereas four is just, I know what four is doing. Maybe it's not doing it very well, maybe it's not the best way, but I know what it's doing. I think maybe even it's more verbose. Like when I read, when I even when I'm like, okay, map DF just to make sure I know what I'm doing, 
the arguments it's it seems short to me it's like harder to which i'm sure is like 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 eric said why it's more like on the more abstract higher level end of it um but yeah i agree i always have to look it up although like i am glad that per came along because now i think i can probably just avoid apply <laughs> and just never have to get in on that well, an another thing that i've found when troubleshooting uh, a loop is that one benefit i find with a for loop is that i can add a statement that just says print whatever this value is right here so it's not giving you the values i want so i want an intermediate value what and, and I just, you know, print that to the console and let me see what is actually being generated. So I can explicitly add a check sum or check digit or whatever, and then say, oh wait, I see what it's doing. It's, it's, it's kind of stuck instead of advancing or something like that. I, I assume you can do that with, with map functions as well. You can add something to you know, tell you what's going wrong in the middle, but it just seems so, so streamlined and clean that I wouldn't even know how to do that. <laughs> Those are great points. Ready for some exercises? Sure. All right. Um, so they just pulled straight from the chapter. So what type of vector does each of the following calls to if else return? So we've got the if else uh, statement um, and conveniently just returns true or false. Or, and that always confused me initially. I was like, why are they putting true or false in there? Um, but yeah, it's just that's what the ultimate output would be. So, um, so you have true on one, you have false on the other, and you have any on, on the last one. And then the other um, areas are the same. So you have your um, true condition returns one, false condition returns no. Um, so with that being said, what does uh, each call return? I think they give. One, no, and NA. All right, one, yeah, so one, no, or NA. And that's exactly it, yeah. So the, the choice is evaluated uh, to true. Yeah, so I said that. Yeah, so it's one, no, or NA, boom, boom. Why didn't I just say it that, that uh, easily? Um, oh, and then the other interesting thing was, is, is, is it's returning, um, different data types, right? So if you're doing this and you're cobbling things together, you, you run the risk of uh, um, and the output being of different data types, which could create an issue. I remember I thought that was interesting, but I don't remember why at, at this stage. Um, Sorry, uh, Eric, do you know if there's an argument if else that will force, like, like uh, coerce, so you don't have that problem? I would imagine if you're getting, if you're worried, yeah, if you're worried about your, um, if you're like doing multiple calls or, or you no, you're doing this. Yeah. If you're doing one call on FLS and you're, you're iterating over a vector, you'd have to handle that externally because it's going to coerce with the coercion rules where it takes it down to um, whatever the common denominator is. Um, so you'd have to handle that manually if you wanted to avoid that. Yeah, it doesn't look like in the help files there's anything that says uh, there's a way to coerce. It just says that it follows from like logical to all the way down. Uh, but I, I wonder if you could add it to, or you could coerce just the, would that, so would that make sense? If you had within your if else statement, your your condition would be like as dot numeric this or something? That would, I think that would be the most explicit way to do it. Just wrap it in as, as numeric or as character. And that way you're, you're taking care of it right at the right at the root. Yeah, and I think probably best practices you want you'd want to as much as possible have both output potential outputs be of the same same type just to save yourself that uh, that kind of problem. Oh, and sorry, just like that. Recently, I had some problems with if else because the it will always try to recycle the the logical so i have a problem like in the first example it was like true false and i ha and i got like a character vector because of the coercion rules because i never thought like that they are really dangerous like if you expect like if you give less or more it will always be recycled 
-hmm. That's interesting, yeah. It does get tricky with when, with that sort of stuff, which is why case win is so convenient. All right, now we've got the next one. So this code works, All right? So the first one's um, giving us a vector one through 10, taking the length of it on true returning not empty, on false returning empty. So it's just checking, is it empty or not? And it works, it's saying it's not empty. And then the second one um, has a, a zero value blank value so it's it's basically um uh, a numeric empty container um takes the length of it on true it returns not empty on false it returns empty and sure enough it returns empty so why is that happening i can answer if no one else wants to the uh, yeah, so the the second one is the one that's confusing, right? Because it actually has a length of zero, and because of that, it, it gets returned as a um, as a zero, which is a false statement, right? If we can rehearse that, so that's why it comes back as empty, which I thought was cool, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I found that interesting. So it's a blank container, but the the res the value is zero. So it reads as false. Yes, yeah, length is zero, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then for the first one, even though the length is 10, it's greater than zero. So it reads it as true. Yeah, I wonder if it's just because it's a logical, right? Uh, if it translates a logical from I was taking that as like, if there is a length value, is that, would that, maybe that's not the correct way of thinking. Like, I always forget the thing where false is zero and, and true is one. I should probably try to remember that more. <laughs> yeah, and I, my, so I do, I, for some reason I was so convinced of this when I was looking at this earlier, that if like one or more, it, and it converts it to a logical, it converts it to true. Yeah, I think that's true, I just check. Right, okay. So that's why that works. It can have as big of a number as it, it collapses it down. Yeah, it collapses it down to um, logical. Logical is the higher order. So I think that's. I think that was his key point. There is trying to get, bring home that um, zero is interpreted as false, and one or any other value that's numeric will be collapsed down to one and. It seems like any value that's non-zero is true. Yeah, uh, super interesting. Okay, now we're in the loop exercises. So this um, code, why does it succeed without errors or warnings? So it's got that numeric placeholder. Um, it's got a uh, container that is gonna contain um, the list. And it's the length of the numeric <laughs> uh, value in X, so that's zero. But why does it work in this case? So it's, I think this is pointing out why he, he uses a sequence along um, versus one um, to the length of, the, of X. But, he gives an example earlier in the text of like, oh, one through length, one through one through length, uh, whatever can give you one through zero, and then it should fail out. And but this one doesn't. Um, and is it maybe because the out vector has uh, the same length? Like since the the if the in if the yeah if the out vector is also zero, it's just like. Oh. That's not that's not a the programmatic. Yeah, I think I think that is it. I, well, I think, it's, <laughs> I think it's I think it's on the right track there. Because you that's when, all I can think of when it's if it, if you do uh, one to the length of x and x is zero because we know it is zero from the previous exercise and from his example, 
then it, it, it returns one comma zero. So like it goes backwards. Um, it's trying to be, it's trying to be helpful, which isn't actually helpful. So uh, yeah, and so because it's zero, it's, it's like, well, I don't know what, what you want. It's fine though, because R can handle unknowns. It just gives us an NA. Yeah. And so you could be, and then, and then that's why he has the sequence long because that will, um, it doesn't return one comma zero under any circumstances. It explicitly tells you that you have an NA, um, which may not be what you want for various reasons. Yeah. Um, I think this is, last one right so when the following code is evaluated what can you say about the vector being iterated so our vector is one two three concatenated list of one two three um, xs is also one two three so we've got two vectors xs and uh, x and then we're, we're taking x in xs And we're concatenating excess with x times two. So what is, what is um what is going on there? It is it looks to me like it's creating an infinite vector. Because the first time it runs. Uh, for x in xs, no. Uh, well, okay, for x in xs, so for x is one, um, it's going to create a new vector appending um, x times two, which will be two, to xs. So xs is now a vector of one, two, three, two. Is that correct? So x is a vector one, two, three, two, yeah. Okay, so now, for x in xs two, it goes to the value two and appends four. So now we have a vector one, two, three, two, four. Boy, I have to run this to see if it goes infinitely. Yeah, I think you have the exact. I think, I think it goes infinitely. Exactly yeah. Right, yeah. I'm not sure because when x equals when when x is five you're not going to have an appended value because five is not going to be X times two. So it might well, stop on X equals five. I, think it I don't like that vector of that, that the vector no, X is a distraction. I don't ever actually think it comes into play. You might be right. You might be right. Oh, you're right. Wait, yeah. no. Yeah. Ha, 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 Yeah, I feel like I that was there to kind of like throw us off. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Because if we replace in the for loop, if we replace x with i, which is the typical index, then yeah. x is not doing at all. Yeah. Yeah, because it does assignment in the for loop, so that name x, that item x, is getting assigned the value from xs. But what this is, so what I thought was interesting is this is exactly what um, the output is exactly what you get if you did like um, xx xs so concatenate xs with xs times two, right? Because um, it's vectorized, so x, if you do xs times two, it's gonna take each element in x, returning the, the, the scaled by two, by the scalar, right? So you'd get two, four, six, concatenated with the items from xs, it's, um, the original xs items. And so the output is that um, one, two, three, and then, the results of scaling each of them by two, the two, four, um, six. And then X is just a distraction, I think, to drive home the point of where the naming occurs, where the, um, yeah, so that, yeah, so it's a, it's a basically just replicating what, you, what vectorized operations would do for you, which I found fascinating. Oh, there's one more, right? All right, one more, one more. Uh, so what does the following code tell us about the index, uh, when the index is updated? So this 
is saying that there's uh, i in the vector one through three. Um, for each loop, we're taking i times two and we're printing i. So what does this tell us about? What does this tell us about when the index is updated? So when is the, okay, yeah. So how, when is the index updated? So the index is updated when it returns to the for loop. And yeah. Not, even though it's printing i, it's not storing that as i. It's not storing it, exactly, yeah. So I, I guess that's what they call a side effect, the print. Mm -hmm. I think it's side effect. Well, I think those are hand, it's handy to know that concept eventually in this book. Yeah, so that's, uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, so the signs of value to i multiplies by two, prints that value, and then it repeats. So at the end, yeah, so at the end of it, in that environment, which if you did this in your regular um, uh, console, not instead of function, then i is going to have the value of six. Um, but you'll still see the outputs two, four, six. Cool. All right, that's it. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, thank you. Welcome. Thank you, guys. And when I see an exercise like this, I think, what kind of madman would actually do this? <laughs> yeah. I think he comes up with stuff to, like, drive home subtle points. It's a good book. Was there any, um, so we went into for loops a bit. Was there any clarity around switch? I feel like I'm, I'm a little. I was very interested in switch. I've never even seen it before. Um, I thought it was really interesting that it works uh, great for characters, and but you shouldn't use it with uh, numerics. And I tried doing the thing he recommends where I read the source code and the source code is just dot primitive switch. And I don't know how to get any further than that on what it's actually doing. Um, so yeah, so if anybody knows, or if anybody has used that, I'd be interested in hearing like how, you, how you've used it before. Yeah, I would like to hear that too, how to think about switch intuitively. I couldn't figure out what is the difference between switch and case when, because it seems like if you have multiple conditions, you can do either. Um, and I've never used switch. I think that it's older than case when, right? Case when is like a newer tidyverse thing. So maybe switch was what worked better before. I think switch is the original base R uh, attempt at that. And um, I remember in my um, first year of grad school, one of my, I was trying to do a problem and one of my cohort tried to show me how to do it with that. And I have forgotten that switch existed like since then. I was like, what was that thing that I used that one time? Yeah. But, <clears throat> yeah, I think it's, uh, it's a holdover from, from C where it is more useful uh, as a primitive function. Um, I've actually never seen case one before either, because I guess I just don't really read D pliers like utility that much. But um, yeah, I think it was useful the one time I did it, and then I've never thought about it again. So maybe it's, I think the idea that it's only useful for characters is not particularly helpful. I was just thinking, I was like, oh, that seems kind of useful because I deal with a lot of character stuff. <laughs> it, to me, it almost seemed like, um, like a vectorized reassignment it, the, the way I read it, especially because it has that syntax of like A equals one, B equals um, this, rather than the sort of like conditional if else statement. Um, yeah, it, it, to me, it, it read very much as like, okay, I'm running through this and if this value is now this value. Um, yeah, it's like- here's Almost like list. a mutate situation. Yeah. And that's what a question I was wondering. It's like, okay, so it's like, here's your list. Here's the values. You find these values in the list then do this but could but could you do any other conditional like logic checks is, is it only equality could you do like um greater than but then i guess that would only and maybe that's why yeah, for characters it's the characters could you just look yeah. for that character value it's honestly like that's why i was thinking it i think maybe okay mike brought this up last week this idea of like we have misspellings in names sometimes and i guess if you knew ahead of time what your common ones are going to be this i do this with species names all the time um no two 
museum collections assistants can decide how to spell things on uh, database entries. Um, so you always have to, you know, there's always a couple where I'm like, okay, this, this is missing. So there's like a, a long list of strings that I'm trying to match just, you know, I mean, and I usually use like mutate at these days because um, I'm living that deep layer life, but it seems like switch could be something useful there. Um, and then it has a sort of, it has its like stop condition to right? if it doesn't. Yeah, and you always need to uh, put that in there. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And I think you can just do stop blank. And, like you don't, because he puts in like text that's returned, like stop, this is what's happened. Right. You always have to have it, but you don't have to put the text in there. Yeah. I don't know. That's what I, that's the thought I had. Well, cool. I mean, I'm, I'm sure we'll, because uh, he dives much deeper down. Um, I'm enjoying learning about all this, just all these little like pretty low level things that I have not encountered before. And I'm also like, I'm, I'm keeping, I'm keeping my eye on this one. Cause I feel like some of them might pop back up. Right. Like, I wonder if there's going to be functions down the line that we know and love and it's like, Oh yeah, this is sort of built on switch or, um, you know, it's just a really great narrative. I'm really appreciating the foreshadowing in. <laughs> yeah. Anything else from anybody? I think that was, that was Switch, that was fuzzy on. The rest of it makes pretty good sense. Oh, repeat, yeah, but I mean, we can explore repeat. I, I think this stuff, we'll, we'll, we'll get more clarity on, on this stuff as we go on, because he didn't even include it in the first book. So obviously you can learn all this stuff without explicitly talking about it if he omitted this chapter in the first place. Um, and he, it gets a short service that I feel like he is just introducing us to the concepts and he's like, everything you learn from this point out is gonna really define your worldview on programming and R. So yeah, not understanding everything perfectly probably isn't detrimental to our development. All right, gang. Cool. If that is all, I am going to stop recording.